Welcome back, everyone, to our next reaction in this fantastic series from Matt Baker at Useful Charts uh, on the Baptists and the Methodists. Incidentally, if you haven't already seen it, and if you're not subscribed to Mr. Beat and to Useful Charts, and if you're not, why aren't you? Uh, they're going to be doing a joint event together where they're going to be asking each other questions. It's a series that Mr. Beat does on his channel. Uh, so I'm excited to watch that. Cannot wait to be a part of it. Uh, we're going to dive into part five today, the Baptist and the Methodist. The link is in the description to the original content without my commentary, as is the link all the way back to part one so you can get caught up. And I'm thinking I might take all six or seven, however many he ends up with, videos of my reaction put it into one big large reaction video that'll be several hours long just in case somebody wants to watch it all straight through and has nothing better to do but let's go ahead and dive into this one welcome to episode five in my series on christian denominations today i'll mostly be talking about the baptists and the methodists two groups that are closely connected to a period of religious change known as the first great awakening there were actually at least three Great Awakenings in total, all of which took place primarily in the English-speaking world. I'll be covering the second one in Episode 6 and the third one in Episode 7. So basically, the next three episodes of this series will be focused on the three Great Awakenings and the various denominations that came out of them. And once again, I want to shout out Joshua from the YouTube channel Ready to Harvest. I relied heavily on him for this episode in particular because he happens to be a Baptist himself. However, he's also produced his own video about the Baptists, which I recommend that you watch after this one. And most of my family, historically speaking, has been Baptist, at least uh, on my mom's side. Uh, when they came up from Kentucky, they were all Baptists. They were all part of Baptist church here in this area. Um, I never have been, but... Uh, I went to the church that was across the street from my house, and that was where I ended up going. So um, I, I, just already seeing the chart, uh, because this is an area I'm more familiar with, I'm aware of at least one denomination that is not showing up on this chart that grew out of the Methodists that probably should be. So we'll talk about it when we get that far. As he does a good job at breaking down all the various different types of Baptists, of which there are many. I love his intro music. It's cool. As usual, let me begin by pointing out a few changes that I've made to the chart since last time. If you've watched the previous episodes, you'll know that I've been building this chart as I go, and that sometimes I incorporate suggestions from comments. Well, one thing that several people wanted was an others section. So I went ahead mm. and added one at the bottom. However, I also added a few other other sections other as well. For example, not all Lutherans belong to the Lutheran World Federation. But rather than include those Lutherans at the bottom, I included them here as other Lutherans. Likewise, I added other Pentecostals next to the Assemblies of God in order to make it clear just how many Pentecostals there are mm. in the world even though most of them do not belong to a single denomination or ecumenical organization. And here's the thing, too, about... So, for example, here in the States, when we think of Pentecostals, we think of a certain type of worship, much more lively. We think of things like speaking in tongues, which I know is a big part of the Assemblies of God, for example. Um, but th that dynamic kind of very active worship style... Uh, exists in many other churches. For example, when we were in, uh, we did a, when I was a youth pastor, we led a mission trip to Costa Rica for two weeks. And we were walking past a church and it was like standing room only. They had the back doors open. There were people outside that couldn't get in. And they were, they had this really like lively music and people were jumping up and down and they had their hands in the air and they were really getting into it. And I assumed it was a Pentecostal church and it was Roman Catholic. So, not everyone does things the way they do them in places like America. In fact, if all the Pentecostals were to create a worldwide communion, they would rank above the Eastern Orthodox Church hmm. as the second largest Christian communion in the world. Finally, the problem is, though, that the Pentecostal denominations vary wildly in their doctrine and probably would never associate with one another, some of them. 
Additionally, I also added other Baptists, as only about half of the Baptists worldwide belong to the Baptist World Alliance. Again, if all the Baptists in the world did unite, they'd be much higher on the list, coming in just above the Anglicans. Now, the reason why there is no other Methodists section and no other Reformed section is because in these two cases, virtually all Methodists belong to the Methodist World Council and virtually all Reformed churches belong to the World Council of Reformed Churches. So there's not really any other Methodists or other Reformed to mention. There are other Anglicans, but at least for now, they number less than a million. So I opted not to show them since on this infographic, each church symbol is supposed to represent around 10 million members. Okay, there were some comments about the world map as well. For example, several people pointed out that Lebanon should be yellow since that country is more than 10% Christian mm. and Catholicism is the dominant type there. So although it's hard to see, Lebanon is now yellow. A lot of Maronites. Germany and Australia were mentioned as well since both of those countries are split around 50-50 between Catholics and Protestants with Catholics starting to take the edge in both places. But I'm going to do a bit more research into the most recent stats before making a final decision. In the family tree section, there's just one thing to point out. Many people requested that the Shakers be added. So mm. I've gone ahead and done that. Their founder was an early Quaker. So I've shown them as splitting off before the other major Quaker groups were formed. Okay, let's now look at the Baptists. The Baptists, along with the Quakers and the Congregationalists, were among the many English separatist groups that left the Church of England in the 1600s. However, as I mentioned last time, most of the other groups, such as the Diggers, Enthusiasts, Ranters, Seekers, and Muggletonians, have since gone extinct. The Quakers have always been a relatively small group, and the Congregationalists, although once a large group, are today relatively small, meaning that it's mostly the Baptists who are the modern-day descendants of the English separatists. Mm. The two men usually credited with having started the Baptist movement are John Smith and Thomas Helwes. Never heard of either one of those guys. Anglicans. They ended up moving to Holland where they crossed paths with the Anabaptists and became convinced that Christians should be baptized as adults, not infants. This is why the Baptists are sometimes shown on charts as being an offshoot of the Anabaptists. However, while early interaction did take place, and while they did share one big thing in common, the idea that baptism should be for adults only, or at least older children, the two groups quickly ended up going in very different directions. So I want to stop and talk about that whole baptism thing for a minute, because uh, to those who might not be Christians or might not be familiar with Christian doctrines and things like that, you might wonder, well, why is there any question about how and when people should be baptized? Well, the confusion comes in because when baptism is instituted in the New Testament, you see it following people's conversion, people becoming Christians. They hear the message, you know, if it's Paul preaching or Peter or one of the other disciples, and they have faith in Christ, they get baptized. And then you have stories of entire families getting baptized. And so then people would look at that and on the surface say, okay, well, people had faith first and then baptism came afterwards. Okay, so it's clear cut, right? Well, not so much because then you have to look at that and say, well, wait a second, Christianity was brand new. So obviously anybody who was going to be baptized chose to get baptized because they became a believer. And that as generations more came along, baptism might have changed. And and the viewpoint by a lot of people is that baptism is kind of the Christian version of circumcision. It's like an identification with the Christian family. And uh, so there's a lot of different ways that that's looked at. And I addressed that last time, but it's not so clear cut. And that's why there's so many different differing views on what baptism is, when it should be done, and what its purpose is. And thus, I think it's better to see the Baptists as being an offshoot of the Anglicans rather than the Anabaptists. Now, in some Baptist circles, there's actually another hypothesis about Baptist origins, 
But before I dive into it, I want to point out that many Christian traditions have alternative views on their origins, views that often differ from mm. the more academic narrative that I've been sharing in this series. For example, the Roman Catholic Church sees themselves as being the one true church, mm -hmm. going all the way back to the Apostle Peter, who they see as being the first pope. In the Catholic view, everyone else split off from them, including the Eastern Orthodox churches. However, the Eastern Orthodox Church holds the opposite view. They see themselves as being the one true church, and they see the Roman Catholics and Protestants as being misguided offshoots. And there are then some Protestants, and I don't hold to this view, but I know there are some who do, that actually believe that the Roman Catholic Church is the Church of the Antichrist, and it is the Babylon that is referred to in uh, the book of Revelation, that it's not only not Christian, it's downright evil, which is crazy to me, but... Even some Anglicans like to see their church as having an origin that predates the Roman Catholic Church. These Anglicans would say that the Church of England can claim an unbroken descent from much earlier Celtic churches hmm. that were planted in the first century. So my point is that the Baptists are by no means unique when it comes to having an origin story that treats their particular tradition as being special. Anyhow, according to some Baptists, known as Landmark Baptists, the Baptist tradition did not start in the 1600s, but rather can be traced all the way back to the first century hmm. through a series of fringe movements. This chart from the 1931 book, The Trail of Blood, illustrates the idea. At the top, you can see the mainstream churches, including the original state-sponsored church that eventually split into the Greek and Roman branches, with the Roman branch eventually including the various Protestant groups as well. The red dots, which make up a trail of blood, represent congregations of quote-unquote true churches that, according to landmarkism, would have been similar to Baptist churches hmm. today. And at the bottom, there's a steady line of red dots, meaning that in certain areas, there existed a direct continuity between the first century churches and the Baptists that eventually settled in America. Note that there's a large gray area marked the Dark Ages, where the Trail of Blood is associated with certain fringe groups such as the Paulicians and the Waldensians. Hmm. Which brings me to this part of the chart, because the Paulicians were in fact a real historical branch of early Christianity. Not much is known about them for certain, but they originally popped up in Armenia in the 600s. Most scholars think that they probably ended up influencing the Bogomils, who emerged in Bulgaria in the 900s, and that the Bogomils, in turn, influenced the Cathars, who emerged in southern France in the 1100s. It's a fair argument to make that many of the denominations that spring up in the last few centuries can trace their theologic roots, theological roots, or uh, their ideological roots to something that came before that maybe is being revived. That's why, for example, a couple episodes back when he talked about people saying, well, no, uh, you know, our idea, you know, for example, say Gnosticism is not a new one that there were Gnostics back then. That's true, but it's not an unbroken line of evolution, so to speak. It was different ideas that have been revived in some way. Also emerging in southern France in the 1100s were the Waldensians, a group of proto-Protestants that I mentioned in episode three. So according to the landmark hypothesis, the quote-unquote true church can be traced from the Paulicians in the Middle East all the way to the Waldensians in France, and then from there through the Anabaptists to the Baptists in America today. Hmm. Now, it probably won't surprise you to learn that I don't agree with this hypothesis at all, nor do most religious scholars, nor do even most Baptists. The general consensus is that the Paulicians, Bogomils, and Cathars probably practiced some sort of Gnosticism, and that therefore they do not relate to the Baptists at all. So let's now return to what we know about Baptists from verifiable history. Early on, there emerged two main types of Baptists, 
Particular Baptists, and General Baptists. Basically, Particular Baptists are Calvinists, whereas General Baptists are not. And the reason why both types are able to coexist is mm. because Baptists follow a Congregationalist form of church government, meaning that each congregation is basically independent and can decide their own theology. However, that doesn't mean that they are the same as the Congregationalists, shown over here as part of the Reformed tradition. And there are a lot of different Congregationalist groups, right? Uh, um, I'm sure we'll talk about it when we get to the Methodists, because I see something on there about Albright, uh, the Evangelical Congregational Church, which is not on this uh, chart, that kind of grew up out of Methodism, um, but was congregational. And that was why they didn't stay joined to the Evangelical Church, which um, eventually became the EUB and then the United Methodists. And uh, the the group that I'm a part of, uh, which comes out of the Restoration Movement, which I know he's going to talk about to, in the next episode, is Congregationalist. Some of these denominations are Congregationalist, and, and, and it means different things. In this case, he's talking about specific to congregations determining their own doctrine. In other cases, it's just a matter of the congregations own their own property rather than it being owned by the denomination. The Congregationalists practice infant baptism whereas Baptists do not. The first Baptist congregation in what is today the U.S. was founded by Roger Williams in 1638. Rhode Island. As I mentioned last time, most of the New England colonies had Congregationalism as their state religion, and therefore Baptists were not allowed. Because of this, Roger Williams helped establish what is now the state of Rhode Island, so that Baptists and other Christians could have a place where they could freely practice their faith. But not other people, because they were just as quick to send you packing or do worse if you weren't in believing what they did. Eventually, the congregation that he started there built this building, which stands to this day and which is known as the First Baptist Church in America. Prior to 1730, the Baptists were actually a fairly small group within American Christianity. However, that all changed with the First Great Awakening. By this point, some Christian leaders felt that Protestantism had become too intellectual. While they still felt that it was important to get one's theology right, which was the whole point of the Protestant Reformation in the first place, they also felt that Christianity at its core should be a religion of the heart. This idea had shown up. I agree. I, I, I've been trying to avoid like giving my opinion on people's doctrines and things like that, and I probably shouldn't anyway, but... There's a place for intellectualism in all of this, too. In continental Europe, a bit earlier, as pietism, but hadn't really taken off yet in the English-speaking world. But then came the First Great Awakening. Basically, the First Great Awakening can be seen as the start of what we today call evangelical Christianity. Mm. Unlike the more liturgical forms of Christianity, which focus more on communal rituals, Evangelical Christianity is more focused on the individual conversion experience. In more recent times, this experience is often described as being born again. What happened during the... Yeah, um, and again, and I know they use that term born again Christian, but the term born again, the idea that becoming a Christian means a fundamental change in our character and our motivations and our desires goes all the way back to Jesus, John 3, 16. Or not, well, John chapter 3, not 16. Um, but in John chapter 3, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee. And the Pharisees, so much of not only them, but their culture was about the family you were born into, the tribe you were born into, the education that you had. And Jesus is confronting him with that and saying, listen, you need to be born again. In other words, stop putting your faith in who you are and start putting it in who Jesus is. So it's not a new concept. I, I, I really hate that that idea of being a born again Christian is a description of a certain type of Christian when that's fundamental to Christianity. The first great awakening is that many preachers, such as Jonathan Edwards, started to preach the grandfather of Aaron Burr by the way if you ever listen to uh, the musical Hamilton there's a line where he says my grandfather was a fire and brimstone preacher that's Jonathan Edwards 
Uh, he's the one who preached the very famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. His daughter was Aaron Burr's mom. Preach more about the need for each person to repent of their sins and to receive the gift of salvation through belief in Jesus. This led many churches to become more interested in missionary work, which mm. refers to trying to convince other people to become born again as well. Thus, among Baptists, the initial division that existed between particular Baptists and general Baptists became less important, with most Baptists unifying to become missionary Baptists, and those who did not support mission boards becoming known as primitive Baptists. Primitive Baptists are very much in the minority today, and the only primitive Baptist church that you're likely to have heard of is the infamous Westboro Baptist Church. The not Christians. I despise those people. They make us all who are Christians look bad. Not Christians. The group known for picketing funerals and for promoting hatred towards gay people. There is nothing biblical Christianity about those people, period. However, let me be clear in saying that they are by no means representative of all primitive Baptists. I simply mention them because they show up in the media quite a bit. Now, one of the results of the First Great Awakening is that Christianity really started to grow among black Americans for the first time, mm -hmm. both among those who were enslaved in the South as well as among free blacks in the North. Most black Americans thus ended up joining either the Baptist movement or, or the Methodist yep. movement. And, and to, to this day, you have a very, I'm sure he's going to talk about it, but the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME churches, very popular. Which we'll get to in a bit. In the South, black Baptists were originally required to have white ministers. However, after emancipation, the first black-led churches hmm. started to form. Now, I should point out that because all Baptist congregations are technically independent, there's really no such thing as denominations right. in the Baptist tradition. And that's an important distinction to make as well, is that sometimes when we're referring to denominations, uh, what we're referring to is a group of churches who have similar beliefs and doctrines, similar practice, but they may not have a kind of governmental or authority structure above the local church. And that's how my church is. We have a bunch of churches in our area that are a part of our system and, and, and ministers will often go from one to another and we all send our kids to the same church camp and we have missionary organizations together and a publishing company and universities. There's just no authority higher than the local church. Instead, Baptists have conventions, which are state level or national level organizations that individual congregations can affiliate with if they so choose. And you can have wildly varying groups within that, right? So, uh, for example, if you're familiar with the Purpose Driven Life or the Purpose Driven Church, Rick Warren out in Orange County, Orange County California, uh, his church is, as far as I'm aware, still Southern Baptist. And so is Jimmy Carter's church. Now, a lot of people have argued that they're not, but I went to, their, to Jimmy Carter's church's website, and they are still Southern Baptists. They're a part of that convention. Very different in terms of beliefs, politics, everything. Both Southern Baptists. However, at the end of the day, they are actually quite similar to denominations. So I'm just going to use that word going mm -hmm. forward. So the earliest still existing Black Baptist convention to be formed in the U.S., was the National Baptist Convention USA, established in 1895. Today, it is the largest historically black church in America. However, in 1915, some churches split off to form the similarly named National Baptist Convention of America, or NBCA. And then in 1961, a different set of churches split off to form the Progressive National Baptist Convention, which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a member of. Oh, okay. Finally, in 1988, a group of churches split off from the NBCA to form the National Baptist Missionary Convention of America. So note that all four of these denominations have very similar sounding names, but don't get them confused because they are actually all different. As you might have guessed, the progressive National Baptists are more progressive. 
whereas the other three tend to be more conservative. In terms of white American Baptists, most of the missionary Baptists eventually formed the Triennial Convention hmm. in 1814. However, because of disputes over slavery, this eventually split into the Northern Baptist Convention and the Southern Baptist Convention. Although, note that the Northern Convention continued to use the triennial name until 1907. And that's an important distinction there, too, is that, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention started out as Southern, but there are Southern Baptist churches all over the place. We have Southern Baptist churches here in Northeast Ohio, so it's not a, it, it's not a great name anymore because they're not all in the South. Nowadays, the Northern Convention is known as the American Baptist Churches USA and they tend to be more liberal, whereas the Southern Baptist Convention has kept its original name and tends to be more conservative. I should also point out that the Southern Baptist Convention is currently the largest Protestant denomination in the U.S., hmm. with approximately 14 million members. This is smaller than the number of Catholics in the U.S., which is around 70 million, but keep in mind that when all Protestant churches are combined, Protestants in the U.S. do outnumber Catholics. Now, besides the Southern Baptists and the other groups I've mentioned so far, there are still several more Baptist denominations to mention. For instance, there's the National Association of Free Will Baptists, Free Will Baptists being another name for general or non-Calvinist Baptists. Then there's the American... And why do they call themselves free will? Well, part of Calvinism is the idea of predestination, that before you were even born, it was already predetermined whether or not you were going to heaven or hell, whether or not you'd become a Christian or not, uh, whereas this is a focus on, hey, everybody has that choice. Baptist Association, which is a landmark Baptist group that holds to the trail of blood explanation of Baptist origins that I mentioned above. But perhaps most important are the so-called independent Baptist groups, out of which the Baptist Bible Fellowship International is the largest. This is the denomination that Jerry Falwell oh, was originally okay. attached to. Falwell is known for having founded the Moral Majority, which during the 1980s grew to become a major political lobby group for evangelical Christians and which laid the groundwork for right-wing Christians to have more influence at the national level, something that continues to this day. As I mentioned earlier, the northern-based American Baptist churches went in a more liberal direction, whereas the Southern Baptists went in a more conservative direction. This led to the Conservative Baptist Association splitting off from the ABC in 1947, because they didn't like that the ABC was so liberal. Note, that they recently changed their name to the Venture Church Network. However, in contrast, there's also the Cooperative Baptist Association that split off from the SBC because they didn't like that the SBC was so conservative. Hmm. Finally, there's Converge, formerly known as the Baptist General Conference and even further back as the Swedish Baptist General Conference. They have their roots in the Scandinavian Free Churches that also produce the Evangelical Covenant Church and the Evangelical Free Church. Now, I should point out that although I focused only on U.S. Baptists, there are in fact Baptists all over the world. Yeah. However, since most of those churches were planted by American missionaries, I thought it was best to focus on the U.S. ones. The one exception to this are the Baptists in the U.K., who, like the American Baptists, can trace their origins all the way back to Smith and Hellas. Hmm. Nowadays, most Baptists in the UK belong to a denomination called Baptists Together. It was also in the UK that the Seventh-day Baptists originated. I'll mention them again next time when I talk about the Adventists. Okay, let's now talk about the Methodists. Whereas the Baptists existed before the First Great Awakening, the Methodists did not. And in fact, it was because of the First Great Awakening that the Methodists were formed. The three big names associated with the founding of Methodism are John Wesley, his brother Charles Wesley, and their friend George Whitfield. So Charles Wesley, if you're not familiar with him, you are probably familiar with at least part of his work. If you have ever sung at Christmas time, Hark the herald angels sing, Charles Wesley wrote that song. All former Anglicans, 
Like many denominational founders, they didn't initially set out to make a new denomination. It just sort of happened. During their youth, they started a group at Oxford called the Holy Club, in which members methodically strove to incorporate Christianity into every part of their life. Other students made fun of them and called them Methodists, a term that stuck and which later became the official name for the movement. In 1739, after having done missionary work in the Americas and having come into contact with the Moravians, whom I mentioned in episode 3, the trio started to preach throughout England in unconventional ways, including outside in the open air. This attracted many working class people who had not previously been regular churchgoers. Yeah, uh, you see that. If you, if you look at the records, you start to see in the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, you know, because a lot of the records that we have for births and deaths and burials and things like that are all uh, Church of England records for the most part. But then you start to see more and more Wesleyan or Methodist records uh, that show up as well. And they very often show up in places where there's a lot of like iron workers, Birmingham, for example, places like that. That's where a lot of this movement happens. And, and this is where you have, in some ways, going back to the first century church, you have instead of people meeting in church buildings, they're meeting in homes, they're meeting out in the streets, they're doing a lot of the things that the early church did. While Whitfield's theology was Calvinist, John Wesley's was not. He emphasized that salvation was available to everyone, and in particular focused on something called the second work of grace. According to Methodist theology, the first work of grace is the initial conversion experience of being born again, whereas the second work of grace is the process by which a Christian is transformed. Some people might use the word sanctification for that. Into becoming a more perfect and holy person. Just a few years after John Wesley's death, the first two Methodist denominations were formed, one in the U.S. and one in the U.K. In the U.S., it was called the Methodist Episcopal Church in order to distinguish it from the Episcopal Church. Right, and so you can see that they identify themselves as Episcopals, as coming from the Church of England, uh, just a particular focus there. And uh, you'll see very often a lot of old United Methodist Church buildings still say M.E. Church on them. If you see an M.E. Church, it's Methodist Episcopal. Which had become independent from the Anglican Church just 10 years earlier. Eventually, the U.S. Methodists split in two over slavery, just like the Baptists did. But unlike the Baptists, the two groups eventually reunited in 1939, which is when they became known simply as the Methodist Church. Then in 1968, it merged with the Evangelical United Brethren Church to become the United Methodist Church. And I don't know if he's going to talk about what's above there, but the EUB was actually born out of splits and mergers as well. In fact, I uh, you see... Up here a little higher, and I don't know if he'll... Let me, let me let him play through this a little more before I comment on this. Which is the main Methodist denomination in the U.S. today. In fact, it is the second largest Protestant denomination in the U.S. after the Southern Baptists. However, recently it has experienced another schism, this time over the ordination of gay and lesbian clergy. And, and it was already, before all of that, was already on the decline 20 years ago, I think they maybe had 10 or 11 million. Now it's more like 6 million. Um, UMC Church has been on the decline for a while. And I actually met my wife in a United Methodist Church. I was hired as the youth pastor at her church. It was a UMC church. And that was where we met. She had grown up in that church. Um, so um, let me talk a little bit about this. Because up above this, he has something about Albright Brethren. And he's got Albright Brethren coming out of the Brethren Church. I'm not sure I agree with that. Uh, because Jacob Albright was a, uh, a pastor uh, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Uh, and the movement that he started eventually became called the Evangelical Association. And they identified themselves as Methodist. In fact, they, they were German-speaking because Lancaster County was very heavily German-speaking. And they wanted to form a Methodist conference for German speakers. But the Methodist church would not 
accept them as a separate Methodist conference. So they formed their own thing called the Evangelical Association. Uh, and eventually what happened is congregationalism seeped into that to where by, I think, around 1900, maybe a little earlier, maybe a little later, I can't remember exactly when, but around 1900, there was a split uh, between those who wanted the denomination to own the property and those who wanted the local church to own the property. And the split, uh, one half became what's known today as the Evangelical Congregational Church. And the half that split off became the Evangelical Church. And then they joined with the United Brethren Church to form the Evangelical United Brethren, who then joined with the Methodists to form the United Methodists. But the Evangelical Congregational Church still exists. And the reason I know so much about this is because I was a pastor in the EC Church. I was married in an EC Church. Um, the Evangelical Congregational Church is a very small denomination. In fact, like half the churches are in the Lancaster County, Pennsylvania area. I think there's 27 EC churches in Lancaster County. There's only like 10 in the whole state of Ohio. They're primarily Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Illinois is where those churches are. In 2022, the more conservative Global Methodist Church was formed. And to date, at least 1,000 congregations have left the United Methodist Church. And the United Methodist Church uh, has created a process through which congregations who want to disassociate with the United Methodist Church can do that. They've got it all laid out. So if a congregation decides, you know what, listen, we don't like the direction the UMC Church has gone as a denomination, it's laid out for them. Uh, and there are conferences. So there's like an East Ohio conference and there's an, a UMC bishop over the East Ohio conference. And they have laid out, if you go to the East Ohio conference website, this is what you need to do. And, and I know in our area, like five or six churches have already done that. And I think there are more that are going that direction. To join it. The split is still very fresh, so it's yet to be seen where all the chips will fall. And why it's complicated, the United Methodist Church, the denomination owns the property. And so if a long, local congregation is going to leave, they're taking property that belongs to a denomination out of that denomination. So it's complicated. Like the Baptists, black American Methodists formed their own denominations early on. So in the early 1800s in the North, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, or AME, was formed in Philadelphia, and the AME Zion Church mm. was formed in New York. To this day, they have remained separate, mm. but as far as I can tell, there's not a lot of theological differences between the two. Then, after the Civil War, a third black Methodist denomination was formed, this time in the South. It was originally called the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, but nowadays is called the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Okay, also separating from the original Methodist denomination in the U.S. was the Wesleyan Church in 1843 and the Free Methodist Church in 1860. They are both aligned with the Holiness Movement, which grew out mm. of the Second and Third Great Awakenings which I'll talk more about in future episodes. For now, I'll simply point out that these two Methodist denominations are, generally speaking, more conservative yeah. than the much larger United Methodist Church. And as I mentioned earlier about the Evangelical Congregational Church, now they do have their own seminary that's in Myerstown, Pennsylvania, which is over in the, in the kind of Lancaster County area there. Um, but uh, a lot of EC... Uh, like kids when they grow up and graduate from high school will go to Wesleyan universities like Ohio Wesleyan or Indiana Wesleyan. In the UK, the main Methodist denomination was originally known as the Wesleyan Methodist Church. However, there were many smaller denominations that broke off from it to form independent denominations. However, in 1932, most of these merged back with the main denomination to form what is now simply called the Methodist Church of Great Britain. The well-known Salvation Army denomination has its roots in British Methodism as well. But And a lot of people don't realize the Salvation Army isn't just an organization that stands outside at Christmas time ringing a bell to collect money to help people. They are an actual church denomination. They have churches. They have pastors. Their pastors have ranks. Like you might be a captain or a major or something. But is aligned more with the holiness movement. So 
Again, I'll talk more about them in a future episode. However, I do want to mention two other churches that have strong connections to Methodism. First, there's the United Church of Canada, which is the largest Protestant denomination in Canada, which is where I'm from. It Hmm. formed in 1925 from a merger between three Christian groups in Canada, the Methodists, Presbyterians, and Congregationalists. The Methodists were the largest of the three groups, which is why I've decided to include the United Church of Canada here with the Methodists rather than with the Reformed churches. Being a Canadian, their logo is something that is immediately recognizable to me since I see it a lot on church signs. What I didn't know until I started doing research for this video is that three of the four symbols represent the three traditions that merged back in Hmm. 1925. The dove is a common symbol used by Methodists. The burning bush is a common symbol used by Presbyterians. And the open Bible represents the Congregationalists. And then you have Alpha and Omega, which is a description of God used in New... um in the book of Revelation. The final symbol, the Alpha and the Omega, is a symbol for Jesus. And the four colors used in the design, white, red, yellow, and black, are colors often associated with indigenous Canadians. In Australia, there is a similar church known as the Uniting Church of Australia. It too formed from a merger between Congregationalists, Presbyterians, and Methodists. I'm not sure if the Methodists make up the largest component in this case, so maybe someone in the comments can let me know. Finally, I want to point out two more United Churches that I've added to the chart, this time in the Anglican section, as in these two cases, it was the Anglicans who were the largest components. In 1927, Anglicans in India became independent as the Church of India, Burma, and Ceylon. However, after the country itself achieved independence, the Anglicans in South India merged with the Methodists, as well as with the South India United Church. So it actually happened right in 1947, which was the year that India got its independence from the British Empire. Which was itself a union of Congregationalists and Presbyterians. The new United Church was called the Church of South India. And to this day, it is the largest Protestant denomination in South Asia. Hmm. The Church of North India was formed later in 1970. But basically, it too represents a merger of Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Congregationalists. Okay, so that was a look at the Baptists and Methodists, as well as the First Great Awakening. All right, so we'll probably talk about the Second Great Awakening tomorrow in episode six. Looking forward to it. If you want to watch it ahead of time, please do. That way you'll be ready to go when I add my commentary in tomorrow's episode. Thanks for watching.